that, I can let people. Hello, hello, everyone. Please take a seat if you don't have one already, and we will begin in just a moment. Excellent. Excellent. Welcome. Bienvenue, konnichiwa, and hi tai, as we say in Okinawa. This session is in English, and simultaneous interpretation will be provided in Japanese. To access this feature, look at the bottom of your screen for the meeting controls. Click on the icon near the right hand corner that looks like a globe, then click the language you would like to hear. So before we begin, I would like to thank everyone who has worked to make this session possible, especially our co-host, the Permanent Mission of Japan to the United Nations, along with the Science Summit organizers and team members who work behind the scenes at Edelman Japan and OIST. My name is Heather Young. I'm the very proud Vice President of Communications and Public Relations at OIST the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And I am also the co-chair of the Science Summit for Japan. Today, we are very fortunate to hear from some awesome individuals. Edelman Japan has assembled a first-rate team. The, discussion, the topic of their discussion is about trust, which is the ultimate currency in the relationship that all institutions build with their stakeholders. First, we will enjoy a presentation from Megan Barstow, the President and Representative Director of Edelman Japan. And then she will be hosting a panel discussion. Megan is an experienced communication strategist known for ethical behavior, strategic thinking, creativity, commitment to quality, and dynamic leadership. So you're in for a treat. I reached out to Megan uh, when we were thinking about possible ideas for this science summit because I'd seen her team's annual presentation on the Edelman Trust Barometer. I suspect some of you have seen that already. Every year, it is an essential read in my books because it's compelling and it's really meaningful in every line of work, I think. So from Tokyo to Toronto to Tunisia to Turin, from whatever time zone you're joining us, I know you will enjoy this session. And I hope you will learn a little bit and be inspired too. Please remember to fill out the feedback session at the end. Megan, the floor is yours. Heather, thank you so much for the introduction and also for the, all, all the support in making this uh, session possible. And hello everyone. It's so nice to be with you today. And it's a true honor to present at the UNGA Science Summit. As Heather noted, I'll be presenting about the Edelman Global Trust Barometer data from 2022. I'll share some of the global trends, the Japan trends, and also talk about where there are similarities and there are divergent trends. We'll also look at opportunities to make a difference and some of the challenges. We also have planned a QA at the end of our session. So I'll do my presentation. We'll then have about a 30 minute panel discussion with our amazing um, panelists that we've assembled who have really distinct and relevant points of view about the topic at hand, and then 10 minutes for the QA. I wanted to just share a brief word about me and also about Edelman. Um, and I wanna thank Heather for the incredible introduction. Um, I have a 30 year long and strong love affair with Japan. Um, in fact, the first time I ever came to Japan was exactly 30 years ago as a college student. Um, I've come and gone multiple times. This is my fourth time living in Japan. And I have to say that it is endlessly interesting and rewarding um, to be here. Edelman is the world's largest communications agency, and we've been studying trust for 22 years um, because we believe it's such an important currency, as Heather noted. So about trust, again, why are we featuring that as part of the UNGA Science Summit? Why does it matter? And as Heather said, we believe it's the ultimate currency that can assess people's willingness to take action 
And I think we can all agree that action now is more important than ever before. We need more action and less empty rhetoric to make real progress. And trust is a virtuous cycle. So action earns trust and trust drives action. So we want to look at how can we drive more of that action and progress and trust amongst stakeholders. So that's what we're gonna talk about as I go through our survey results today. Before I dive into the actual presentation, just so that you know about the survey, 22 years of study. It is an online survey. We conduct it in 28 countries, 36,000 respondents uh, globally, and at least 1,000 respondents in each country. We assess the trust in what we say are four major institutions. So government, business, media, and NGOs. Um, so let me dive into that data and talk a little bit more about what's happening now and what are the opportunities to really make a difference as it relates to sustainability. Great. So uh, 22 years, as I said, um, and here's a great snapshot slide, and I really love it because our trust survey has often reflected major events in the world. You can see how trust changes. And sometimes we're even able to predict some of the changes that are going to be coming or impacting our institutions. We started our survey in 2001 after we saw the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle. We felt that was a major sea change to see the resistance to a formerly very respected institution and felt that we needed to study and learn more about that. If you look at 2006 and seven, you'll see that a person like me emerged as a credible spokesperson. Oh, 2005 and six, um, there's a shift to a trust in peers versus authorities. This is when Twitter and Facebook were launching and building their following. 2009, you can see trust in business plummets, the Lehman shock. 2012, definitely in Japan the year before, there was the terrible Tohoku earthquake, and that really impacted people's trust in government's ability to respond effectively to that disaster. There was also the ongoing war in Iraq and the fallout from the Arab Spring. You'll see in 2018 and 17, trust in crisis, the battle for truth. That's when we started to see a rise in populist leaders with Trump and Bolsonaro and others. From 2020, we've been studying uh, the impact of trust uh, from the pandemic and other incidents in the world. And now in 2022, we're saying that we have a cycle of distrust. So let's talk about that. The status of trust in 2022. Let me first have you look at the global trust data here. So on the left is this year's data. Dark blue is trusted, light blue is neutral, and then red is distrusted. So globally, you'll see that business is the only trusted institution. NGOs had a little bit of a increase from the previous year and government and media, a little bit of a decrease. Look at the right, that's May, 2020. We called that the little trust bubble that happened right after the pandemic hit. And we saw that globally, people had an initial surge of trust as they saw government and business and NGOs take action and provide value to stakeholders in the initial response. Let's look at Japan. Hold on. So Japan um, is not the same as the global trends. You'll see it's all red. Yes, so there is no trusted institution in Japan of the four that we study. Similar to global, business is the leader uh, within those groups and NGOs also follow closely behind and had an increase. But you'll see on the right, that was also all red in, uh, in the early days of COVID. There was no trust surge. And in fact, in Japan, there's always traditionally been a lower level of trust, sort of a low state of trust um, all along the way. 
So let's uh, look at something that's a bright spot. This is exciting, I think. It's an incredible opportunity for employers. It's a similar trend uh, globally and in Japan, but you'll see that in Japan, employers, my employer, my personal employer is trusted. Um, they are in the blue. It's the only trusted institution in Japan. It's a 22 point differential to the average trust. That is an incredible opportunity for employers in Japan. And globally, you'll see that on the right, there's also a big trust differential. Another interesting trend that we've noted is that there's a significant difference in trust uh, between those who are high income, higher trust, and low income, lower trust. And there's a significant gap there. I wanna draw your eyes to the Japan data. Low income trust levels in Japan are at the bottom of the list. If you look at the high income, it's not at the bottom, it's a little higher, it's in neutral territory. It's a 21 point gap for Japan. I think this is remarkable, um, especially because many people still view Japan as a country as fairly egalitarian, not a huge income gap. That's changing and it's also becoming as an issue for people here in Japan. They're concerned about it. This to me is the slide that is of most concern. Um, we ask people, will my family and I will be, be and I be better off in five years time? And you can see this year, nine countries had all time lows. And Japan is at the very bottom of the list, negative two points from the previous year and only 15%. This says that institutions in Japan need to take notice and need to drive hope and optimism in Japan. So let's talk about some of the drivers of distrust. Where is this coming from? We said this year it's a cycle of distrust and this data is part of what's driving that. We see that distrust is the default and many believe there's no basis for peaceful debate. Look at the data on the left. It is incredible that you'll see that 75%, three quarters, three out of four people in Japan, their tendency is to distrust until proven otherwise. They need to see evidence before they're going to give you their trust. It's really important to earn that trust in Japan. Really important data point there. The other one is on the right, you'll see that many people perceive there's a lack of the ability for constructive and civil debate. Globally, 64%. Maybe people who are in Western countries would not be surprised by that, seeing the many partisan debates, but Japan is 58%. And that might surprise people where it's uh, a country known for such a focus on harmony. Now, this might be because there are just no guardrails and platforms and opportunities for that psychologically safe debate in Japan. It might be for a different reason, but it's still, very much an issue here that people don't feel they can have that dialogue. So during the pandemic, uh, you know, it was a tough time for so many. We saw the impact on trust and we saw that fears, fear in general has risen globally. And that's also the case in Japan. Look at this slide, plus six, plus six, plus five. People are worried, people are scared. In Japan, it's worth noting that the number, the second highest fear is climate change. It's a real concern in Japan. People take it very seriously. Fake news uh, concerns are at an all time high. You'll see across the board increases from most countries and in Japan as well. It's a little bit of a bright spot this time that Japan is at the bottom of the chart because that means that they're not as worried, but still over 60% do worry that fake news will be used as a weapon. And that is reflected in this slide here. On the left, you'll see that societal leaders are the least trusted in Japan and the media is the least trusted. So only 23% trust journalists. 
the bright spot, which I'm super excited about, if you look at the far right, you'll see that Go Japan scientists are the most trusted spokespeople and a huge plus 11 increase. Yes, Japan, way to go in believing in scientists and science-based information. Really great to see. Big bright spot. We also asked respondents about the role that they see those four institutions playing in society. Are they a dividing force or are they a unifying force? And here you'll see again that continued mistrust of media. 40% believe that media is a divisive force. Opinions are split on government, half and half. And then you'll see that business and NGOs have a license to lead with almost 50% believing that they are unifying force. That brings me to the next section, which is about the role, the societal leadership now required um, for business and organizations. So on this slide, you'll see that Stakeholders expect more of business and they hold them accountable. They vote with their dollars, they vote with their time, um, they do it for you know, buying products, choosing where they work, how they invest their money. They want to take action and align with organizations that share their beliefs and values. And this is happening in Japan. It's almost 50% now. It's not far behind the global rate. So we need Organizations need to know that stakeholders very much care about the beliefs and values. We also see in Japan that people want more, not less, business engagement on societal issues. Here you'll see that the first three are items that appeared earlier. This is the Japan data here but they do believe that business needs to be more engaged as it relates to economic inequality. That's the number one point. Second, climate change. And third, trustworthy information. They want business to be more involved, more vocal on these issues. And that relates to the CEO data here. Um, again, Japan is not lagging far behind the global expectation, which may surprise some or sometimes some people, or we may have to really reinforce this to leaders in Japan, stakeholders, people want their leaders to be more visible. 74%, almost three out of four respondents want their CEO to be visible on public policy and talking about what their company does and how they give back to society. And almost a little under 50% of people in Japan want their CEO to take a stance on controversial social issues that they care about. That will surprise many um, that that is how strongly people feel here. And it's something that I see will only increase and increase 5% in the last year. So I wanna to touch a little bit on the role of information. We've seen that come up already that people think that's an important aspect, something that they're worried about, something that they value. Um, we see here that information quality, having quality information is the top trust builder for all the organizations that we assess, business, NGOs, government, and media. So that's more important, for example, for business than get results. The information quality, what information are you providing to people? Same for government. Information quality more than taking a leadership role. People want to be informed in a credible and trustworthy way. We also see that good information can help close societal divide. I think this is so important. Look at this data. You'll see that we noted earlier that there's a huge trust gap between low income and high income. But then when we look at um, that with a lens of well-informed, we'll see that the, that gap disappears. Someone who is lower income but well-informed has relatively high trust, and someone who's high income but not well-informed has lower trust. Information is trust power, right? So it's not just power, it's trust power, really important. So I wanna close my section here uh, with my takeaways, um, just top line summary, which we'll talk more about in the panel. One, 
okay, this is no surprise to anyone on this, you know, listening to us today. Stakeholders expect more of institutions. They want leadership to do more, not less, okay? It's time for action. No more just empty words. Tangible progress, that goes to that as well. Commitments are great. How are you going to do it? What are the commitments? How are you making a real impact? The third one, thinking long-term. So focus on that long-term impact. Think long-term over the short-term gains. Great opportunity for Japan. It's a society that thinks in you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 year blocks, companies here with over hundred years of history. Um, this is a real potential area of leadership for Japan, continued leadership, I should say. And then every in institution should provide quality, trustworthy information. It's clear information is trust power. So thank you for listening to this presentation so far. I'm now going to shift to the real um, jewel of the session, which is the panel discussion with our very esteemed panelists. So let me um, take this slide down and then I will introduce our panelists and dive into the conversation. So I'm presenting our panelists by alphabetical order from their names. So I'm gonna start with Mr. Luke Date. He is an incredible, incredible, really inspiring up and coming Gen Z founder, uh, president. Um, I it, was able to work with him through his work with Uminari, which means voice of the ocean. He does partnerships with a variety of stakeholders from business to elementary school children, um, and is also involved in other activities, but he's the voice of the future, I would say. Maybe you should change your name to voice of the future instead of voice of the, the, the ocean, Luke Song. <laughs> but we'll be joined by Luke, so thank you for that. Next up is Tova Kinooka. Tova has been in Japan for decades and runs an organization called Global Perspectives that specializes in sustainability consulting. She works with organizations across a broad, broad range of organizations from business to NGOs to chambers. Um, and she, I like, I've started to call her, I don't know if she likes me calling her this. She's the walk the talk lady. She's like, we need to stop talking about it. And this is how we make it happen, folks. Um, so I'm really looking forward to her perspective and how she's helping organizations do just that. And Last but not least, we have Vanessa Oshima um, as a panelist who's also spent decades in Japan. And I think her company name, Heart Data, says a lot about her approach. She's an incredible brand strategist who's worked with leading global brands, Coca-Cola, Nike, Starbucks. And she really specializes in sustainability and purpose-driven programs and more, um, and also based on deep data and insights. So I'm looking forward to the insights that she will share with us today. So thank you all for joining. We're going to start with a softball question just so you can have an idea of these amazing folks. We're going to do a quick word association, um, go round the clock. Um, I'll do it twice too, word association. So what pops into your mind when you hear the word trust? Luke thought. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um <laughs> to my trust. Uh, in general, right? Yes. Mm, but um as you mentioned, I'm running a nonprofit organization and um to our uh, activities, I always uh, keep in mind that uh trust is uh the most uh, valuable asset that NGO has. That's yeah, uh, something uh, on my mind. I love I, that. Yeah, yeah, the word of trust. It's top of mind at the center of your program. That's amazing. Thank yeah. you. Tova, how about you? Um, I really like what Luke just said there. I think it, you know, valuable <laughs> asset is wonderful. I, I think I would add to it something you just mentioned, Megan, which is power. I think trust mm. is power. Without it, you are powerless. I mm. think so. I'll go with power. Love that. Yes. Vanessa? 
Yeah, so I'm going to go with an onomatopoeia to build on that. So that idea of, uh, you know, it starts with trust and the build on power. But for me, when you say the word trust, the first two words that come to mind are transparency and timeliness. And mm. so it's like, if you have transparency, you will build trust. But it also needs to be done in a timely manner, not like months later, oh, by the way, kind of thing. So when you say trust, for me, from a brand messaging point of view, the first two words that come to mind are you know, transparency and timeliness. So that would be my answer. TTT. <laughs> and always a, a set of three, a framework of three. I like that. Framework of three. <laughs> okay, then one more. Sustainability. Toba, sustainability. Sustainability is um, interconnected, I think. Oh. Um, people, planet, all of it. We can't go without each other. So interconnected. Love that. Luke, how about you? Uh, sustainability is a space for co-creation, I say. Mm. Connected co sustainability is a, yeah, actually an opportunity uh, where a variety of sectors uh, can be connected and uh, find, you know, um, core purpose. So. Wonderful. Vanessa? Uh, so I, I love that the collaboration, the connectiveness. I think when I think about sustainability, the first word that points to my or comes to my mind is the future it, it's mm. it, it, that when we talk about sustainability it's not just sustainability of the planet it's sustainability of our relationships human relationships all of these things so I, I just the word that pops to my mind is sustainability equals a bright future and without it there's not a bright future so that's the, that's probably the, the word that comes to mind the future like Luke has to be, you know, Mirai Nadi, not Umi Nadi, Mirai Nadi. <laughs> Thank you. Like that. Well, that is a good setup then for my first question, speaking about a bright future. Um, my question that I want to pose to the panel, these folks who know Japan so well, represent Japan, why is the trust data in Japan so dang low? Especially when you know those of us who live here and those who see it from outside know what a harmonious stable and efficient country it is what's going on why is it so low and does that matter is it impacting the ability to drive progress who would like to take that one first oh maybe maybe uh, i'll go okay. i'll go oh, okay. yeah. no no go okay. Liz. Vanessa and then luke great <laughs> okay well, um, I suppose that uh, some part of the low trust, um, especially among a young generation in Japan, uh, comes from low understanding, I mean, lack of understanding, I guess, in mm -hmm. the first place on politics and economy in general. And uh, that uh, lack of understanding comes from lack of communication. Mm -hmm. And um, that's partly because, you know, uh, in my opinion, major part of uh, broadcasting here in Japan is not really focusing on politics and economies. And so that there's um, not so many opportunities for people mm. to uh, get in touch with those topics. And then I think uh, there's uh, not so many opportunity for people to discuss on those topics. So I think... Um, um, there's the problem, but uh, at the same time, that can be an um, opportunity for uh, corporates uh, to provide uh, those opportunities and place uh, for people. I think uh, there's a demand. Uh, you know what? I, I was going to say, what I was going to say first is now changed based on what Luke has just said. Because, uh, <laughs> no, well, I was going to. Well, yeah, co-creating. What I was going to say is, um, you know, with trust that often Japan, um, you know, after many decades of living and working here with brands and things, it's very, um, it's very sure-footed. And so it's, it's like, you know, I come from New Zealand. And so if we're like, oh, you have 50%, I think I can get it done. Okay, yeah, sure. Go. And, and, um, but Japan is very sure-footed uh, to say, you know, I'm going to go forward with a, a level of confidence that I can get it done. If I say mm -hmm. yes, 
it means I can probably get it done. In New Zealand, it's like 50 percent saying, yeah, 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 let's go. And so that idea that Luke just said, which is to be able to say, I have confidence in this, I trust this, you've got to have that base knowledge. And without that base knowledge, there's not that ability to say, yes, I, I trust this or I 100% trust this. And so I love, you know, of those different media was the one that was the, the least trusted. So we had business, we had NGOs, we had the media. And it's like, I don't trust the media, which to me was really interesting because media should be that, that conduit mm -hmm. that is sharing to us the knowledge and we trust it. It was a really interesting... Um, not, you know, we don't really have a problem with fake news, but I'm not sure that I trust the media so much. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of tension, uh, mm -hmm. but totally agree that the trust is about that foundation of knowledge and that, you know, I feel confident in what I know to be able to say, I trust. And so, you know, do you trust this organization? And so do you trust this NGO as well? I don't know enough about them. It's not that mm -hmm. I distrust them, it's just I don't know enough. And as you said in the media, you know, maybe we're, we're not opening up enough information, creating enough discourse uh, that would give that level of confidence and level of trust. So that would be my, my thought. And the role of brands um, and companies to do that, to take leadership, would be something I'd like to really think about as well. Thank you. Tova, anything to add to that? Solving the solving Japan's trust problem. Any solutions <laughs> there? Okay. It's a big one, isn't it? It's interesting if you look at a lot of the, the cultural research data around trust and how it's different in different societies. Um, Japan is always termed to be a very sort of relationship based trust culture, right? So in order to trust, you really need to have a, a personal connection to the source mm. of the information. So I think that's really interesting in the data you were showing us earlier, Megan, the fact that you know, CEOs in general or business in general, the trust is sort of mediocre, perhaps. When you go to my CEO or my colleague, suddenly that trust jumps up. And I think that's really interesting to see here. And maybe back to what Luke was saying, that's because it's what we know, right? We, we know about my company, about my colleagues, my CEO, we can trust that. Stuff that's outside our, our sort of Uchi, our immediate interior um, kind of network, perhaps might be less trusted simply because we don't know that much about it. Yeah, so we're hearing, you know, one is just the availability of information uh, to consume, perhaps the ability to really consume it appropriately, um, the platforms and safe spaces to have that conversation um, and create those connections, right, Tova, that you talked about relationships yeah. are really important to do that um, and to come to that solution, that sure-footed solution that's so important in Japan, right? Like, yeah, um, you have to have the right answer before you you go forward, um, but it requires a lot of dialogue and nemawashi, as they say, to get to that point. Well, let's talk about some good stuff. So there was some really good data. I know I love I, people say I'm Pollyannish, but I like the good stuff. So there was some really good data um, in bright points, scientists, the major increase, business and NGOs as a unifying force, um, my employer. So what, what other signs of optimism do you see in Japan? What's the, what's the optimism for the future that you want to share with listeners on the call and what are what you see are the major risks um, for Japan looking forward building trust driving progress and sustainability so you don't have to answer both of those but I'd love to hear you know something that you think is really optimistic that you want to share or something that you think is a real concern um, that needs to be tackled uh, rapidly so I'll go first with uh, Tova so you went last last time do you have uh, anything to share um wow where to start um i'll try and keep this really brief um i think one of the key things that concerns me in the work that we're doing and in the the conversations we're having with organizations is there's still a a lack of sense of urgency mm. um and i i'm 
I was actually quite uh, encouraged to see in the data you showed, Megan, that the, the second biggest fear was around climate change, mm -hmm. because we haven't felt that until recently, I think, here. And it, it's been terrifying me um, as the mother of two children and thinking about their future. You know, it, it's genuinely scary. So mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been that sense of urgency. And so trying to explain to, to companies why you need to make these changes now, um, when perhaps in Japan, we're have been in a little bit of a bubble. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're not feeling the strength of um, climate change in the same way that other parts of the world are. And so people have, I think, been kind of lulled into a false sense of security. Um, but that seems to be changing. I think in the last couple of years and the pandemic seems to be um, really accelerating awareness of the fact that these things are interconnected, like I was saying at the beginning. And uh, so I think that's a silver lining, if you like that. That's giving us an opportunity to say, no, this does actually involve us. Um, Japan yeah. is part of the global ecosystem. Um, and so I, I'm seeing signs now that uh, people are recognizing that, companies are recognizing that, and are starting to get more serious about taking action. Thank you. Yeah, urgency to act in the you know, the pandemic, as awful as it was, um, there are some outcomes that have, you know, changed the conversation and the opportunities. Um, and I think that is right. That's one of those that people are really taking this much more seriously. Luke, how about you? The, the voice of the future. What's the cause for optimism or concern? Yeah. Fill us in. Yeah, for um, one of the op uh, optimistic uh, aspects I see in Japan is that uh, nowadays I see some momentum towards a wide range of cooperation. Uh, like some companies are now trying to uh, have a partnership uh, beyond industries or even with competitors or uh, other type of entity like uh, with nonprofit organization that we call N2X, um, nonprofit mm -hmm. organization with uh, corporate. Mm -hmm. um, one case is that now uh, I'm uh, working with a um, developer company and we are uh, offering a place, uh, the physical place uh, in Tokyo, uh, where our youth and other sectors and generation uh, can discuss about anything, mm -hmm. do anything. And yeah, that's based on the uh, wide range of cooperation. And that's actually a good for a company as well, as um, in that example, uh, they can you know, uh, access the real insight and perspective of the future generation. Yeah, yeah that's gonna be a huge asset for the uh, corporate, so. How do you get people to share their candid honest honne in those dialogues is there a something that you do to facilitate that conversation it sounds great i love i love that that you're offering that safe space mm -hmm. uh, i don't know uh i do it naturally <laughs> you do you're really good at it <laughs> mm -hmm. but um what is that um it's not supported by a uh, solo sector or company mm -hmm. uh you know, that's the uh, factor that mm -hmm. uh, makes the, um, the place a very neutral body, I guess. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah, there's no real agenda, perhaps, because people are coming yeah. together on that common cause. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love that example. Vanessa, how about you? Yeah, so I think building on that, like, you know, that, that sense of urgency, that collaboration and coming together, what I was encouraged to see in the data was this idea of this expectation of business to step up. Um, mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we've always seen in Japan is business having um, these kind of leadership roles, whether it's um, some of the, you know, the innovators like Matsushita-san and Honda-san, and, and, and they've got a vision of what it should look like in taking business business's role in society to not just deliver dividends to Wall Street, but mm -hmm. to actually make society a better place and, 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 and develop and, and give back and build. So I think that that data was also showing there's an expectation 
of business to step up. Uh, I think also the other thing too, which was that foundation of information quality. I think that goes back to the first question as well, which was like just really wanting that information quality and being able to bring different angles of the information together so that we can actually have a conversation. So we're not just talking about, oh, let's look at that one star or that one data point. It's like, here are the stars and here's the constellation mm. that we're seeing. Here's the thing that we're seeing. What I feel now is, is that this idea of a brand uh, is not transactional any longer. Like I buy this, you sell this. There's an expectation of the brand and the conversations with corporations to be much bigger than a transactional buy sell. Mm. There's an engagement, there's a level of purpose. I'm buying not just the product, but the entire package of what the brand does. And it doesn't end with, I bought widget A and then I consume widget A or whatever. It's like, what happens afterwards? What happens with the waste? What happens with your investment? What happened? And so there's this longer customer journey now that's mm. expected. And also to the role then of business uh, to work with the NGOs, to work with government. I remember doing a, you know, a workshop a long time ago. And one of the questions like is where have all the leaders gone? Where has that leadership voice gone? <laughs> so it's, it's like, where have all the leaders gone? And so it's a perfect opportunity to step into a leadership voice, whether it's Luke's son with his NGOs, you know, and his Uminati to say, this is my voice. This yes. is how, and, and taking that leadership position or whether it's, it's a corporation that decides to take a stand on a particular thing as you know, was mentioned. I trust my employer, the person mm. who's close to me. And so, you know, how do we, yeah, create leadership? And just to, we had this big thing about what is leadership? Does that mean we all have to be a president and we all have to, you know, lead? And it was this idea of leadership means you have a vision and a courage to act on it. Mm. Then you're leading, whether you're leading in your neighborhood, whether you're leading in your group of friends, whether you're leading in, it's just, you have a vision of what it should be. And the courage to take that step forward is leading. And so it doesn't have to be, you know, I have to start my own company or I have to start my own political movement. It's, I, I can see something and I'm, I have the courage to take that step mm -hmm. forward as, as you're leading. So I think that's where I was getting encouraged in the data is that there was a yeah. request for leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. And so now is the time to sort of say, where do I step in? And step in where you feel most comfortable. You don't have to lead on mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. The leadership is a great question. What does leadership mean? And, you know, I was so excited to have Japan represented in this uh, UNGA Science Summit this time, because I personally believe Japan has been a leader in sustainability and making bold commitments early before others. And business has done that as well. Um, and so one, I think Japan should get credit for that. Um, and I think, you know, there's more work to do, but I do believe that in many ways, Japan is positioned really well from a mindset and um, behavioral point of view for continued leadership. Um, one data point that we'd had in previous surveys that was fascinating is that during the pandemic, most we asked um, uh, people in each country, you know, what 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 should leaders be prioritizing? And most of the responses were like, you know, help for us and, you know, investment in our healthcare system. And then there was one helping people outside your country. Japan was the only country that had that as one of the leading answers. It was remarkable, right? That they said, no, during the pandemic, we should be also making a priority, a very high priority of helping others. So, um, I'd like to hear from all of you, you know, what are some other ways that Japan, Japan NGOs, Japan government, business is positioned for continued leadership? Where are ways that, um, that you, you, we, we, we think that they're well positioned for the future? Tova? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, did Vanessa want to start on this one since you've been Vanessa, nice to... yeah, Vanessa, go. <laughs> well, I was going to say Tova. Tova's walk the talk. So it was like, um, so <laughs> I think the other, oh, I don't know. Let me speak from a, um, uh, from a, a business point.
point of view, maybe, because uh, I work with um, and have worked inside businesses, uh, you know, that very first step of making sure that these conversations are actually part of the strategic planning process um, mm -hmm. and, and not just an afterthought. Uh, oh, I guess we should do something around SDGs. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's actually part of the plan uh, because it does actually build engagement and loyalty and, and uh, with, with your, you know, with your consumers, with, with the organization, but it's also your right to exist, uh, mm. to be able to be. And so I think that that's, you know, rather than um, often you have CSR and SDGs are like this little team that's sitting off to the side um, yeah. doing quote unquote special projects or SDG projects. And the more that it actually becomes um, infused into everything that we're doing to basically look, do we know the SDGs uh, beyond just being able to wear the rainbow pin and, the seven, and, and list them out the 17? Do we know which ones we as an organization will be focusing on uh, within our HR policies, within our, our branding, within our marketing, within our sales, within our impact on the environment? And so I think that that's, I don't know if that's kind of answering the question, but it's, I think Japan's ability to infuse uh, and think about it. When I think about innovation, uh, you know, you, you said just now a really interesting comment, which was Japan, you know, has been able to innovate. Toyota brought out the Prius, you know, way before everybody else was really thinking about it. Uh, so, you know, I think that that's the, uh, that's kind of the, the areas that I would be thinking about is where are we actually able to lead and put that voice out there onto that global stage uh, a little stronger. So, mm. because we have great ability, great innovations, uh, and also part of our culture almost, you know, like you said, this idea of harmony and, and things. Yeah, so that would be my kind of fluffy answer, but I, I think it needs to be incorporated more strongly into the plans as part of that's where we we need to take leadership in that to show that that it's not just off to the side it is but also too that we can stand on the on the on the global stage with you know the thing don't be afraid of standing standing on the global stage mm. yes exactly get out there and talk about what you're doing employees want you to do that don't they we saw Okay, who's next then? You're right. How can, good. How's yeah. Japan positioned for great leadership? <laughs> I can see he's excited. Okay. Um, Go, Luke. <laughs> um, I think um, Japan has strength in um, craftsmanship and technology. Um, and I think it can be adapted, especially in the field of uh, circular economy. Mm. And um, I think uh, many of you uh, already know that um, many experts say uh, Edo period in Japan from uh, 17th century, am I right? 17th century <laughs> to 90, uh, yeah, in Edo period in Japan, uh, the city uh, was modeled as a circular economy while mm -hmm. uh, the city already had over a million people. Like I love everything, that. yeah, everything was um, uh, repaired uh, when it's broken and everything mm. was uh, recycled uh, for agriculture and um, other things. And one example I think um, it's important, uh, interesting is that uh, Kintsugi, mm -hmm. which I uh, want well, all of you to uh, Google uh, later. <laughs> uh, Kintsugi <laughs> is um, uh, it's about repairing uh, plates and uh, bowls. Uh, yeah. And um, the remarkable point is that um, it actually increased the value from original. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that kind of craftsmanship and yeah, in nowadays uh, technology, like uh, chemical recycling, for example, compared to the material recycling, uh, the conventional one, is um, the place that Japan uh, can take leadership globally, I think. I love that Luke mentioned Kintsugi because I think what I love yeah. about Kintsugi as well yeah. <laughs> is that um, it's actually a really, it's a beautiful, like you said, craft. It's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And as yeah. you're doing this thing, which is really beautiful, 
uh, and uh, like a hobby almost. Mm -hmm. You're actually learning about the circular economy. So it's not like, oh, I have to yeah. do circular economy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's something very beautiful about it. And through osmosis, you're getting into that circular economy piece. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we call it like easy echo or easy, like make it easier for me to understand this, make it easier for me to mm -hmm. do this. And yeah, so I think that, yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's about, you know, system and uh, technology, but when mm -hmm. it's uh, mixed with a uh, cultural and traditional context, mm -hmm. it's better. Mm -hmm. And um, sustainability is about uh, future, as Vanessa Sam mentioned, but um, mm -hmm. there's something we can learn uh, from the past as well, and uh, well featured um, um, for the, you know, future plan, I guess. You're so right. Like the past we were, maybe we were less about convenience and more about that sustainability. And so mm. dra dragging in, you know, the cultural pieces and the pieces from the past, I think, are, yeah. You got me thinking again, Luke, <laughs> every time. He's a wise man, isn't he? Because yeah. really I love that the traditional that's so relevant today in a modern way and it um, represents that circular economy that's beautiful. Well, Tova, you have your work come out for you. What is your... Uh... <laughs> Well, I, I love that example you shared, Lou. I think that's really great. Um, and I, I think also, I mean, going back to tradition and culture, just like you were talking about there, um, Japan, if you look back again in the past, um, I think it was also Edo time, had this concept of Sampo Yoshi, another thing to Google after this, um, which is where the, the goods have to be good for the seller, good for the buyer, but also good for society. So society has also, you know, has always been part of that equation, if you like, in Japan. And I think maybe some of that's been lost in, you know, the last few decades with the the, the rush of globalization and competing on that world stage. But it's still there. It's in the DNA. Um, and something we're often looking at with um, the, the companies we work with here, particularly the ones that are Japanese, but they're global organizations, or they're the Japanese um, arm of global organizations, is how do we make this relevant for here? Mm -hmm. Because yes, at a global level, an organization needs to have one sort of overarching uh, sustainability strategy, but that needs to be localized so that it's appropriate and relevant and people can connect to it mm -hmm. in each particular um, region or you know country that they're in. And I love this fact that in Japan, you have got this concept of community of just thinking about others, not just yourself. Um, and that's a real asset when it comes to stuff like this. I think you can easily help people understand, you know, the, the why in the sustainability um, conversation. It's not look, you know, we have to do this because we have to see, you know, be seen to be doing good. It's it's like, oh, okay, of course, that makes perfect sense. Of course, we want to benefit society and community. And I think that's a really powerful, um, sort of deeply ingrained cultural aspect that Japan can really tap into um, and, and can also share with the world and sort of help us to look outside our own little bubbles. I am so fired up by the opportunity <laughs> that we see ahead. And I think it's really, I mean, but it's so authentic. I do experience that. I see that. I work also with many large companies here. And I, I think the mindset and the approach is quite different. And I think it's really um, very promising for what's possible. We have seven minutes. So I just want to see, I promised a QA. I don't see any questions, but does anyone have a question that they'd like to put into the chat for us? Okay, well, we can always um, look for questions later, but since I have seven minutes, so I guess I will go with my last question, which is, you know, what's your message to those who are listening? Um, uh, oh, thank you, Keiji. Uh, San, I have so many, I have so much trust barometer data. Uh, we actually do an annual survey and then special reports. Um, so 
Um, reach out later. I can share more. We have more data coming this year about climate change and technology. So um, please do reach out on that one. Um, we're always releasing new data. Um, but I guess my final just uh, you know, question or request of you all is, What's your message to the listeners or to leaders out there? And let's make it a hopeful one, right? Like we're all here. Those of you who are listening, you're listening because you care and you want to make a difference and you want to be part of the solution. So what's your your final message for, for folks that are listening and beyond? Maybe I'll, I'll go. Um, yeah. So you know, we're part of the science summit. And I think that that's something um, that we shouldn't forget. It's about that data, about the science, about technology. And my, um, I don't know, my hope uh, and my optimism is that we will see this coming together of like of technology and science uh, uh, being utilized to create this kind of like really um, important path forward. But what we've seen with the trust data is that, you know, that about that information. So we've had some key words that have come, which is like collaboration and information. And so we go back to that idea of like transparency and timeliness. And that's what excites me right now is like we're at this moment where we're basically starting to see, you, I know that you said 2022 was the era of distrust, but I feel like it's um, we're coming out of that distrust to say, how do we trust again? And mm -hmm. so I think that's, and we've got some really clear um, path I don't know, indicators, like this is how we'll trust again uh, and how we expect. And I'm excited of the request to have business, have NGOs, have the government uh, to, you know, to be more involved. And, you know, the thing about the media, what Luke said right at the very beginning, which was like, you know, the Japanese media does mm. less of this. We need it to do more of that. I think that's also a signpost. And so mm -hmm. I've got my mind spinning now about, how do I get involved in that? Uh, and I think that's the thing, just one step forward. It's like just one step forward. If we all take one step forward, it could be 10,000 steps exactly. or a million steps. It doesn't have to be, we don't have to run the marathon all at once. It's like, I'll do the first kilometer, then I'll hand it to Luke and he can do the second kilometer. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that idea of that collectiveness, I think that's what excites me about Japan. When Japan moves as a collective group, when it moves, it moves. It I moves. Think that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Luke, how about you? And yes, uh, please, everyone, fill out, fill out the form at the end about the session. We'd love your <laughs> feedback on how we can improve it in the future. I'm just putting that in there, too. But Luke, go ahead. <laughs> um, it's close to uh, collectiveness. Uh, it's about partnership. And uh, one of the five basements of uh, SDGs is partnership. And I think uh, corporates and um, yeah, NGOs and other sectors, um, especially corporates, I believe, uh, has you know uh, potential and responsibility and actually an opportunity to take leadership in the field, uh, not only for their own but uh, for bigger purpose. And I mm. think uh, there's always a way of uh, using it as a leverage of to enhance their business performance yeah. Uh, way. Yeah. Win-win. Sampo -win. Yoshi. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> Tova, how about you? So you only get a um, we have to wrap up. So only one minute, Tova. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so in a nutshell, ecosystem thinking. Um, look at the big picture, look at the value chain that you're part of. Wherever you are in that value chain, however big an organization you are, however small you are, you have a role to play in that. And you have power agency to to shift things so like Vanessa was saying even if it's just one step one small action that's a start that can then influence others to make changes and all of these things are interconnected so one thing starts to shift and everything can suddenly start to move forward a lot more easily so think big look look broadly instead of well as well as long term and straight ahead so um that'll get us all moving I think Love, Love it. it. Think, think big, big, start small. <laughs> think yes. big, yes. Step by step. Absolutely. Think big, but take a step, step, step. I love it. Well, yeah. listen, I want to thank you, um, our panelists, for the conversation, your time, our organizers, uh, the audience for coming and listening. Thank you. 
And I also want to thank our interpreters. I'm sorry, sometimes we got excited and talked fast. So excuse <laughs> us, but you're incredible. So thank you all and have a wonderful day or evening or whatever time zone you are in. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.